So welcome back. Yes, it's that time again where we're going under the water to find out everything you need to know, quite frankly, about everything. We have various different subjects and today's subject is the feeder, not the method feeder, the feeder. We're looking at wild style fishing now, but there are loads and loads of myths that we're going to bust. There's tactics we're going to look at. So, for example, what happens when the feeder hits the surface? Where does your bait come out? When you're retrieving, what happens to it? In fact, all sorts of stuff. Now, we don't know the answer yet, but I can guarantee that by the end of the day, we will, and so will you guys. So let's get in the pond. Joining me, of course, I have got my old mucker, Jamie, but we've got a different one today. I've sacked the hues. We've wheeled an even better one out. This is the Harrison. Again, bit of a reunion. This got the band back together. It is first victim. Yes, it was ages ago, long time ago. Very eye-opening video, and yeah. we had loads of feedback on that. And look what's happened since then. Absolutely, and we're going to find loads out today as well. So, what would you like to find out? Oh, there are so many things that we don't know, but we think we know. We've all got opinions on now. We think the feed is empty, how quick it empties, where it empties, and what kind of spread it is. All things like that that we don't know definite answers to. So, we are at a rather nice carp pond. There might be some fish in here. Bream wise, skimmers, tench, roach, perch. So we may see some fish, but the whole point of today really is looking at bait more than anything else. We've got clear water, we've got gravel. What do we think it is? Five, six foot out there? Yes, yeah, it's not too deep. Uh, it is clear, obviously. That's going to help, obviously, with filming. So I can't wait. This is the kind of thing where I can't wait to watch this because we're going to get some answers today, aren't we? You know, I've been doing this for years and I learn an awful lot every single time I do it. I know every angler on the box does. So uh, yeah, let's get in the pond and find out some scores. Can't wait. Right, we're ready. A very common way of starting any sort of match or session is to put some feed in initially. So we're going to try and replicate that. I'm going to put five feederfuls of bait out there in quick succession, just as though I was going to start a match. We've tried to keep the camera as still as possible to see how accurate Jamie's five casts are when he's baiting up. As you can see from these clips, his casting is pretty accurate. We've placed markings showing roughly where Jamie's feeders have landed in the swim. From this angle across the water, these casts look to be further apart than they actually are. These five casts have all landed within a two metre square of each other. Well, that's the fifth feeder full. Um, this is quite a dry mix. It's shallow water out there, we know that. I personally think there's going to be quite a bit of spread. This style feeder holds the bait in a little bit better than a wire cage, but we're using this one because we can see it easier on camera. So it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of a spread we've got now that we've put those five feeder falls out there in very quick succession. Right, let's go to see what they look like. Five underwater. As we head under the water, the first thing to notice how hard it was to find the first feeder. The ground bait from this small feeder creates a very small dusting on the bottom. Five of these feeders will not look like much at all. You'll notice that Jamie's included some particles in the ground bait, and these help me find the feeders in the first place. With this small feeder, these particles are very prominent on the bottom. Yeah. 
What's interesting about the small horizon feeder is the shape of the dusting and where the ground bait ends up in relation to the feeder. We'll have a longer discussion with Jamie about this when we head back to the bank, so stay tuned for that. So what we're going to try now is, it's quite common on lots of feeder matches these days to what we call fill it in. A lot of people refer them to as coke can feeders. Basically, it just means putting a volume of bait in. So that's what we're going to try and replicate now. I'm going to put five cagefuls out there, just on the same spot, or in the same area anyway. And we're going to see what kind of spread we're going to get on that. Big feeder incoming. Here's an interesting finding for you. And you can see the difference. You know, the last one, the angle of the tree was about there. That's landing there. That's a good four foot, five foot further, maybe. Four foot. Anyway, that's one. That's two. Good shooting. It's noticeable that this big feeder makes much more disturbance on the water when it lands. If you look closely at the feeder landing, you'll also see some bait coming off the feeder as it hits the water. Again, Jamie's accuracy, even with this big feeder, is very good, with four of the five large feeders, again all falling within a two metre square. Only one feeder fell outside of this area. Only just two. Lovely. Last one on its way, and no. now, and that's close. Oh, shot. Right, let's go under and have a look at it. The first bit of bait I come across with the baiting up feeder is a light dusting of ground bait particles along with a few of the heavier particles, such as corn and dead maggots. These will have exited from the feeder before it's hit the bottom and have fallen straight down to the lake bed behind the feeder. You can also clearly see the large clump of ground bait that was in the feeder when it reached the bottom. Instantly, this is a much more recognisable pile of bait compared with the smaller feeder. The particles stand out well in the water and there's a good amount of ground bait in the swim. As I visit the other areas where the other cast with the bait up feeder have landed, we can see the same pattern emerging with each feeder that entered the water. There's always a dusting of bait just behind where the feeder has hit the bottom and the main pile of bait has come out of the feeder when Jamie strikes the bait out. There's also one other interesting finding with the spread of bait, or lack of, but we'll discuss this in more detail with Jamie later. This type of baiting I'm sure would keep several fish occupied around your swim for a period of time, but the important thing to bear in mind is your accuracy and where your rods are clipped up to, especially if you're using a dedicated baiting up rod. One way that we can trigger bites when we're fishing, we talk about it a lot these days, but not everybody kind of adopts that technique and that's overwetting your ground bait. It can be a great way of putting a different kind of a cloud in your swim. So what we've done is to replicate that once again, we've just added some extra water to this mix. It's exactly the same mix. We've put extra water with it so it's sloppy. We've changed the key, cage feeder so it's one that will empty really quickly and we're gonna have a look what kind of a cloud comes off this wet mix.
Before I even reach the feeder that was loaded with sloppy ground bait, you can see the cloud it created hanging in the water. As we go down to the feeder, you can see that most of the ground bait that was in the feeder has released on the fall. There's only a small lump left in the feeder where the bait has landed. Coming back up in the water, the ground bait particles are still slowly falling through the water column. These particles have clearly exited from the feeder near to the surface and are landing as a fine dusting of bait behind where the feeder has landed. Let's have another cast and see what results we get. Again we can see the large cloud of ground bait particles that have come out of the feeder. You can see here just how close these ground bait particles are to the surface of the lake. The feeder is emptying high up in the water, creating a column of bait down to the lake bed. Back on the lake bed and you can again see the small clump of ground bait that was left in the feeder with the dusting of bait falling behind. Exactly the same as the previous cast. Now, let's go back to Jamie and discuss some of the findings. Right then, findings, my dear friend. Mm. Um, first and foremost, Crest doesn't taste nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not Crest, um, duckweed. <laughs> Tastes a bit cressy. Anyway, um, right, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, with the small feeder, you were pretty good on your accuracy, but there's hardly any in it. Really, right. Literally, you know, it looks like virtually nothing. And I would think that, you know, if, if a half decent carp came along, they've done the lot in two minutes. You know, looking at how much bait we use as carp anglers against how much you lads use as feeder anglers. On some venues, five feeder pools will think we're, there's verge of overfeeding, but obviously Yeah, well, there's if you look at there. the footage, they, you know, it, it, it's, there's hardly anything. It's interesting as well, seeing the style of the feeder. I think you've got, have you got it down here? Where On is the, it? There, the, there's one. Yeah, the plastic horizon, yeah. So it's interesting thinking about the feeder as well, because you've got it there. And that discharges very differently from something without an open end on it. Uh, because obviously when it goes in, it's holding a bait in. When it comes out, it pulls it back as well. So you get almost like a comet tail of bait. That's the easiest way I can describe it. So there's a little pile and then there's a tail scattering of very light bait as well. And that's probably foot to 18 inches long. Is it? Right. There so that is actually blocking the feed coming out at the back as we've got you. Yes. Got you. Yeah, you know, you'd think it might wash all the way out, but it yes. doesn't necessarily always wash all the right, way out. Right, that's interesting. Some casts it did, yep. some casts it didn't. Okay. But if there is any left in there, then you're not having a complete, complete lump. But certainly it was noticeable that there were little sort of marble sized balls and then a scattering around the outside right, of it. Okay. So you're not getting a really tight area. I personally quite like it. Uh, I think it's nice to have that little bit of a spread, but it didn't look like there was an awful lot out there, so you probably need to put a bit more on. Got you. Okay, that's interesting. Never thought of that. I mean, we do use these feeders quite a lot, and we've always said that they do hold, or we thought they held the bait in a bit better than the wire one, yes. which is nothing behind it, and you've just confirmed that, yeah, I yeah. think, haven't you? Yep. But that's really interesting. So, when we're looking at the amount of bait, I think that's the, that's the key thing for me. You know, that, that will be gone in no time at all. So I think it's always worthwhile. You know, the fish always tell you what they want anyway, don't yes. they? And if you're putting too much in or not. But I, I, I see this when people are spawning carp bait in as well. They'll put half a dozen spawns in and think it's a lot. And the reality of it is it's nothing. <laughs> and what I generally say on the carp side of things is that you should triple the amount you're putting in to get in what's in your mind's eye. So triple? You know, oh, easily. So if you put five out, what you think is on the deck, you probably need to put 15 out <laughs> right. to achieve that. Okay. So there or thereabouts. And it's the same with spoms, it's the same with carp bait, it's the same with whatever. You've just got to put a lot more in. Because when you look at it, you think there's a lot there and there's a reasonable amount in the feeder, but some of it comes out on the way down yeah. and sits there with little particles in the air, which ultimately will drop down as dust, but it's a very fine dusting anywhere. Some of it will land in a pile and some of it will go off. And if you just work on the law of averages, then you're only getting a third down in your baited spot, you get a third scattered and there's a third up in the water as well. Got so you. if you use the rule of three, three times as much gets you what you think it is on the deck. So that's a real that's, eye opener, that's that one. point number one. Okay. Right, let's have a look now at the, the bigger feeder. That was really interesting. Yes. 
that didn't spread as much as I thought it was going to. Right, okay. So, and seeing how you're casting out, letting it land, your casting was bang on with that, by the way, you know, <laughs> the, once, you'd, once you got your eye on your spot, it was really nice and it built up a really nice area, but there were actually lumps. So because there wasn't an end on it, yes. depending on how your bait hit the water, it would either split on the surface and give you a wider bit, or yep. alternatively, it would go down, and then when you retrieved it, leave not quite a tennis ball lump, but that sort of a lump on the bottom. Right. So I would have thought that that might have spread out a little bit more, mm. but actually that was putting measles everywhere. Right. Because okay. obviously it's quite wide. So when you pull back, the first time you pull back, it completely discharges itself. Whereas when there's a block on the end of it, obviously it'll drag a little bit back and leave a tail. Mm. The other thing that is, is vitally important, I'm going to look down the barrel of the camera now and remember this, this is vitally important as well. Absolutely 100% now. You know how you want to be as accurate as you possibly can and get your baited spot in one go. If you're baiting up with the big feeder, but fishing with the other one, you're fishing in a completely different spot. And I would say it was probably six to eight foot difference, even though wow. you'd walk down the bank and clip them exactly the same distance because of the weight of it, because of the difference in rod, because of the way that you're casting differently, yeah. it was landing a good six foot further wow. than the other one. And the photographs will show this because I was taking, the, the camera was in a nice angle with a reflection on the tree and you see the first lot landing here and the next lot, the first one landed out shot. So as much as six foot? Easily six foot. Now, on the bank here, you would think it's probably around about the same. And, and because you've clipped it, you think, oh, it's definitely going to be the same. But it's heavier, it's bigger. There's a lot more going into it. What I think it is, is you've got a little bit more bounce back on the springy rod. Yes. So it goes in and bounces back. Whereas with a heavier rod, it tends to hit and you tend to follow it stays through. stays there, right. And that's the difference. So you've really got to analyse your casting style because basically you could put a load of bait in and push the fish away from you course and then okay. you're fishing this side of it and you're fishing this side of it so you're not going to get any liners you're going to think it's done nothing at all you know if your bait's falling short you get liners you draw back to them mm. but if you're fishing short of a big better bait so if you've put big you know if you've bucketed it in and thought you know what that's a great spot they're going to be on that the chances are they are and if you're not getting bites stick another half a rod length on your fishing rod and got see if you get the bites there got you because ultimately what they'll do is they'll clear you out and eventually they'll find you, you get a couple of bites and it may or may not work so always something to think about and you know we do it again in carp fishing all the time we're looking at where the marker float is how far behind we wrap to be able to get on the same spot right and i think if you were to add half a rod length possibly even more but half a rod length should do it you'd be more or less on the spot and you'll see the difference so wow something to think about there um that brings me on to uh, the, the the final one now, which was the softer mix, which was really the overwetted, the overwetted, the mix. wetted mix. Yeah, it was actually it didn't stay in the air as long as I thought it would do. It dropped down quite quickly, so you'd okay. see those particles in the air. But to be honest, there were particles in the air on all of them, and I call it in the air. You know, I mean up in the water. Yeah. But there were particles up in the water on every single one. The wet mix, yes, it was there, but it would still drop down. But what it did was it gave you a very a much bigger dinner plate sized dusting of bait on the bottom. So you know with oh, okay. your small one, you've yeah. got a comet line. Yes. With your big bucket, you've got a lump yes. or a clump. And then with the other one, you've basically got a much bigger bit. So dinner plate even bigger, where all the dust is coming down and settling because it does sink quite quick. You know, you wet it, you think, oh yeah, that's going to cloud up. Actually, it's in the water, it's not wet anymore. Because right. everything is wet, so it doesn't wet. stand out because everything's wet. Right, got you. Know, dry stuff's got only wet until it's wet. Once it's wet, it's wet. So <laughs> that's makes a, perfect that's a, sense, I mean, doesn't it's it? It's an obvious thing to say, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I see it a lot of the time. With we, you know, we 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 look at what it looks like in the bucket. We think, oh yeah, there's loads there, but half of it's water. And of course, when you put water in water, it negates itself. You don't see it. So that dust sort of falls like a fine snow all over the place, and then you'll have a little lump, which is the bit that stayed in the feeder. Okay. But, and this is a casting point again, reverse it completely to what we talked about. So you know if you're getting bites and they dry up, rather than pulling short, go longer. Because what's happening is if the surface of the water is here, your bait is hitting the top there, the feed is hitting there, and it's swinging back in again. And everything's getting... And it's landing here. So your bait is there on the deck, all your dust is on the deck. You've got one small lump here with your hook bait somewhere near it. And if you're not getting bites, or if your bites dry up, it's worthwhile adding another foot, 50 centimetres maybe, 
depending on the depth of the, the water, depth. you know, that was five footish deep there where we were doing that. In deeper water, it's going to be even further. But if your bikes are drying up, basically you've got to add a little bit more because effectively what you're doing is when it's discharging on the surface, you need your bait to be directly underneath it because gravity says it falls straight down, whereas you're coming on a swing back. Mm. Now, I don't know what it's like with these. This maybe is a test for another day, but normally with carp fishing, we say around about a foot for every three foot. So okay. for every three foot of depth, pull a foot back okay. or further forwards, depending on what the spawn is. Uh, so, you know, might be the same there because if that was five foot, I would say it was probably 18 inches. That's interesting. And if there was a wind and tow on it as well, that's going to That'll have a massive that difference, us. yeah. We, we haven't got too much tow today, you can see, with all the scum on the surface yeah. here. But if you've, if you've got a wind on it, the wind generally will not have that much effect unless it's been going a long time and it's towing back the other way. Yep. And that's when your cloud will move. But the mix that you've got there actually sinks quite quick. Oh, you right, know, because okay. the, the granules in it are quite firm. When they're wet, they're still quite heavy. Uh, so although it feels quite wet, like I say, once it's in water, it's, it's in water. Yeah, of so course, it goes yeah. back to its original form, which is, which is quite heavy. If you want more of a cloud up in the water, you'd want more uh, like tiger flower or something like that in it. But that's for bait gurus, not for, not for <laughs> us to think about. Um, but the key thing is thinking about, firstly, you know, the tool that you're using. Yes. What do you want it to do and is it doing it? And then what you're then doing is changing to a different tool. But you want the different tool to do the same job, which it can't because it's a different tool. Got you. So just think about how those tools apply and the big one goes a little bit further, the small one drops a little bit back. But really, really interesting. And I think the, the, the biggest finding that I've got from that is that the baited area is going to be lovely, but because you might be doing something different with a different weapon, it's going right, to okay. be fishing in a slightly different place. So all you need to do is add or subtract a little bit to get the best out of it. Now, the chances are you're going to get bites anyway, in which case, happy days. But it's when those bites dry up that yeah. you think, oh, where have they gone? And, you know, when we're fishing spot over zigs, and this is a really long piece now, but it's a similar sort of method. When we're spotting over zigs, and you might find that the water's 10 foot deep, and you're catching them on eight foot zigs, and then the bites dry up, and you think, oh, they've gone. They have gone, but normally they've either gone that way or that way. They don't often go that way. Right. So they're still in the same place. They're just up and down in the water column. And with spotting over zigs, what we normally do is you put one on the bottom so you can see if you're getting the bites down there, and or, or alternatively put some floaters in and see if they'll come up and have them off the surface. Okay. Because they generally don't move far off that column. Right. And it's the same with your bait there. So if you're dropping it through the water, they'll be somewhere around it. And if you're fishing four foot short, mm. you're missing them. Add a bit more. Very thing. interesting. Yeah. There we go. Some of these things that we've obviously, you know, sometimes just changing the feeder can get your bites. Yeah. For no reason, but obviously we know. But that might be it. Th that could be part because of the reason. Because, you know, what, what are you doing when you change your feeder? What is it doing? And, and strip everything back. What is it actually doing? Well, for a start, it's delivering bait in a slightly different way. And secondly, the cast that you make with the different feeder will land in a slightly different place. Yeah. And I'm very much of the opinion that Occam's razor, and I talk about this all the time, the simplest explanation, 80% of the time, is the correct one. Mm. And the chances are, if you're not getting bites, it's because the fish aren't there. Where are they? Well, if you've fed the area, they're going to be around there somewhere. So all you've got to do is just move slightly more around that area. You know, perch anglers will tell you the same. You hit a few there, they'll move off. They're not going to be a million miles away. They'll just be, just move. they'll have moved to safety somewhere. It's Very exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether it's carp, whether it's predator, whether it's match. Fish want to feed, give them food, they'll be there somewhere. But we need to be on them. There we go. Hope it helps. Fantastic to get some answers. Well, that was very, very interesting. It's been great to have a few things kind of um, confirmed and it's certainly opened our eyes to quite a few things. For me personally, um, I'm taking three key things away from this. Hopefully you're going to be taking something away from this as well that's going to help you um, catch more fish. The first thing for me was, was the wet mix, the difference between how the feeders were emptying. With the wet mix, I actually used um, an Horizon wire cage feeder. And what that was basically doing is it's emptying behind where the actual feeder is ending up on the bottom. So a lot of the feed is coming out of the feeder. It's landing behind the feeder of where the actual feeder is going to be resting on the clip. So for me, the best way of combating that, I love what a wet mix does, how it can trigger extra fish. However, if you're going to have several casts like that, you are depositing bait behind your feeder. So for me, that's definitely going to highlight where I could just go that little bit further past and try and fish over that area 
where it's landed behind the feeder. So that's definitely one key thing that I'm going to be using in future. And on the flip side of that, point number two for me was the initial feeding that we did right at the start where we put five or where I put five feeder fulls in, that was with that style horizon feeder, the actual plastic one. And we've always kind of thought that, you know, felt that this holds bait in better. And that's why I use that kind of a feeder when I've got a fish at range, when the wind's bad, in deeper water. And that has been confirmed. It definitely holds the bait in more or holds it in better. However, the key thing that I never really thought through was because of the design of that feeder, that is actually encouraging bait to stay in there even more when you actually retrieve the feeder. So we were getting almost a trail of bait of what was coming out of that feeder. So on the opposite of point number one, that is if I'm struggling with line bites or little indications or I simply stop catching, one of the things I'll definitely be doing when I'm fishing with a feeder like that is trying shorter. Try and, try and present the, the hook bait into that trail of feed that's been building up as you've emptied the feeder. So that's definitely one that I certainly overlooked. I just never thought that the, that would actually be holding the bait in as much as what it actually has been. And the other thing is, which is to, for me personally, it's an absolutely massive issue. And it's one that, you know, it has raised concerns over the last few years whilst we've been using feeding feeders. And that is when you've got two rods clipped up at what you think is the same range, whether you've used sticks, you've counted turns, whatever it might be, the style of feeder that you use and the rod, the rod that you use can determine whether all that bait is going in the same spot. You know, that's been a massive thing for me today. And the reason why that's an even bigger issue than the fact that it's not accurate is that when you're using a baiting feeder, by its very nature, the reason why you're using that feeder is because you're putting in a volume of bait. So that makes it, that compounds it into an even bigger problem because not only are you fishing in a spot different from where you've fed, but you've actually fed a, a large amount of bait as well in a different area from where you're fishing. And for me personally, I've got to openly admit on a very personal um, um, scenario, for me to go out and practice that, I've got to work on that and get that right. Because not only do I need to make sure that when I've got a feeding rod set up, as opposed to um, a natural rod that I'm fishing with, that's planted a seed in my mind now. I've seen that for real today, just like you've seen it. So I now need to get my confidence back that the next time I'm clipping up a feeding rod, that that feed is actually going to be the exact same spot as where I'm actually going to be fishing. It's been a real eye opener, but the beauty about it, it, you know, this is not a video that's based on opinion. We've actually seen facts and that's the beauty of this series of videos. Well, that's been another very interesting session, Rob. Thank you very much for confirming no lots of things, but you've also raised a few, uh, a few issues that we I certainly need to work on personally and we really really hope that you're going to take something away from this to help improve your fishing. Absolutely don't forget there is loads more to come this is the place to see all of your underwater match stuff. We've got loads coming up including a really really good very funny and incredibly interesting Christmas challenge. So you know what to do share like subscribe we're on YouTube we're on Facebook we're on Instagram Wherever you are, we'll be. Look out for a bit more coming from us. And of course, that Christmas special.